Now that our silicone is completely cured, we can demold our master. Although the demolding process can be very straightforward, we'll want to understand some key principles that can help us along the way. Let's review them and then get started demolding our master. The first key principle is to go slow and steady. We've put a substantial amount of effort into our project thus far, and moving too quickly and recklessly here could lead to tearing the mold, damaging our master, or another issue that could ruin our project. Taking our time and being methodical will help us. Our second key principle is to remember the specific silicone we're working with. When we chose our silicone, we looked at its physical properties, including its hardness, elongation, and a few other attributes. It's important that we remind ourselves of those properties so that we can both use them to our advantage and also so that we avoid asking our material to do something it just wasn't designed to do. If we used a silicone with a limited elongation, then applying a lot of stretching force during demolding may push the silicone to its breaking point, tearing our mold and ruining our project. Our third and final principle is to use our mold design as reference. Now that our mold is complete, our master is inside our mold in a specific position hidden from view. Knowing how our master is positioned will help us determine the best ways to remove it without damaging our finished mold. Having our reference images on hand and using any outside markings we've placed will be a great benefit during this process. Our first step in demolding is going to be removing the mold box walls. Not every type of mold design will have this step, but the majority of the molds we'll create early on will follow this construction. Let's look at the best practices to follow and some things to keep in mind while we remove our walls. Our first thing to pay attention to is the construction of our mold box. Depending on the type of mold box we used, we can approach this process differently. If we used a convenience mold or even a light duty mold, we can most likely just tear away at our mold box since we don't plan to reuse this material. Keep in mind how the material of our mold box will affect our demolding though. If we used a plastic container, we may need to carefully use an X-Acto knife or another tool to cut it away. If we find ourselves running into sharp corners, then properly protecting our hands is a good idea. A foam core construction is usually easy to remove without the need for additional tools or safety equipment. If we used a more heavy duty construction with screws or another type of fastener, then we'll need to be more methodical with how we actually remove our mold box. Keeping track of the walls and the fasteners can make rebuilding our mold box easier if we plan to make another mold. In this case, we can label our heavy duty materials with useful information, including the project that it's associated with, the amount of silicone we used, and any other helpful notes that we may want to recall for the next time. With our walls removed, let's look at getting our base separated from our mold. Earlier in our process, a key step was adhering our master to the base. What we use to lock our master in place will impact what we do to remove it now. For masters that were screwed down or affixed using another heavy connection, we'll want to remove any fasteners before trying to remove our base from the mold. If we don't, then we may add stress to our mold or the master itself that could cause damage to either. If we used another, less intense way of adhering our master, such as hot glue, then we know that applying a slight amount of force will most likely unstick our base. When we go to remove our base in this case, we'll take our time and apply steady pressure without aggressive actions. A steady pressure will release the glue and allow our base to come right off. Regardless of the construction we used, we may run into a fair amount of suction between our silicone and the walls of our mold box. This is normal and will require some steady pressure to break that suction, introduce some air, and then remove our wall. Before we demold our master, this is a good time to briefly clean our mold so that it's presentable and stores easily along with our other molds. This is an optional step, but it's always nice to have a clean and tidy workspace, and that includes our molds themselves. 
The main area to clean up will be the edges of our mold. Flashing is common on the edges since our silicone will fill every void possible, including any of the small spaces and gaps that may be between our mold box walls. To clean this flashing, we can either use a pair of scissors to cut along our edges or an X-Acto knife. If we're using our X-Acto knife, then we'll simply place our mold onto our work surface, align our knife to the edge against the table, and then run the blade along the mold. This will give us a clean edge and a simple process that we can repeat for each side. Although this step is optional, it's a great way to elevate the molds we make and ensure a professional finish if we're doing work for a client. With our mold now in front of us, we can look at the base of our master and see if we need to clean up any silicone that may have leaked under. It's important that we remove this extra silicone since it may either hold our master in place or could affect our future castings. Let's look at how to remove this flashing easily without damaging our mold. Before we just start cutting away, let's look at the base of our master and determine how thick the silicone that leaked underneath is. If the silicone flashing is extremely thin, then we may only need to gently peel away the thin flashing since it won't have a significant amount of hold. If our silicone flashing is too thick for this, then we'll need to grab our X-Acto knife. When going to cut the silicone, it's important that we start slightly away from the edge. Trimming the majority of the silicone will give us a better view when we go back and more closely trim the edges of our silicone. If we start at our edge, we may accidentally cut further into the mold and damage it. If we remove our master before trimming the flashing, we may lose any reference for where the edges of our master start and end. If we're not careful, we may end up cutting away more than we need to, leaving a hole in our mold that will show up in every casting we do. Keep in mind that silicone rubber is more easily cut when it's under tension. Trying to cut silicone without that tension is difficult and often results in a poor cut. Adding a slight amount of tension by gently pulling on the edges of our flashing will allow our X-Acto blade to glide through our material. It's important that we take our time trimming this flashing and only cut what we need to. Cleaning up the base of our master will make locating and removing it much easier in our next step. Now that the base is cleaned up, let's begin demolding our master. As we go about this process, it'll be vital that we understand where our master is positioned and how it's oriented in our mold. If we don't understand its orientation, then we may spend time trying to remove our master in a way it was never designed to come out. To understand how our master is positioned, let's look at a few references. Our first reference will be any marks that we made on the outside of our mold. If we use these marks on our mold box and transfer them to our mold, then we can use these as reference along with our mold design to immediately understand how everything is positioned. This is especially useful if our mold is larger or if our master is completely obscured from view. If we don't have any reference marks, then we can look at the base of our master to give us a clue to its orientation. Reviewing our reference images or drawings, we can see how the base is shaped and how the shape relates to the rest of our master. Once we know these relationships, we can understand how our master is positioned inside of our mold just by looking at the exposed base. If all of our references and markings fail us, then the easiest way to get an idea is to gently pry open our mold. Just a light pull on the corners will usually reveal a little more of our master, giving us a sense of its position. After we know how our master is positioned, let's put our mold in an orientation that will make demolding as easy as possible. We can determine that position by reviewing our mold design to see what direction our master will more easily come out of. If we're working with an undercut, then we'll need to make sure that we're pulling and stretching in a way that will accommodate our situation. With our cleaned up mold in front of us and our master location determined, we're ready to begin stretching our silicone to remove our master. Some projects will be extremely easy to demold, while others may take some dedicated time and effort. Regardless of our situation, let's go through the process of demolding our master and the steps we take along the way. Our first step when removing our master is to start at the top and gently pull away our silicone from the base. When we do this, we're breaking the surface tension between our silicone and our master, introducing air between the two and allowing the rest of our process to go smoothly. With our silicone separated from our master at the top, 
we can continue to separate the two by increasing the amount of force we apply to our silicone. However, just pulling on the silicone may not be enough. It's at this point we're using one hand to actually grip our master and using the other to flex our silicone will make things easier. We'll need to keep in mind throughout this process how much elongation we can expect from our silicone and how durable or fragile our master is. It's best to flex our silicone a small amount at a time, rotating our mold as we do to ensure our master is being removed evenly. If we focus only on one side of our mold, we may put in more effort than is necessary. As we continue demolding, loosening the grip that our silicone has on our master, we can begin to increase our grip on the master and attempt to leverage it away from our silicone mold. It's best to do this gently at first before attempting with a little more force each time. If we start too aggressively, we may damage either our mold or our master. If our part does not come out at this point, we can use the attempt to understand that there is a specific area or section that's limiting our ability to remove it. In these instances, we can determine the problem and then find another angle that will help address that specific issue. As we stretch our silicone, we are introducing air between our master and our mold. The last area to separate is usually the top of our master that's actually located at the bottom of our mold. We may have the sides completely free, but still need to address the bottom. If our silicone is flexible enough, we can reach down inside and dislodge our master and finish the process. However, this isn't possible every time. In these cases, pressing the bottom of our mold against a corner of a table or another surface can assist in dislodging the final section of our master. All of these techniques are critical, especially when demolding a one-part mold. If we're working with a multi-part mold, then the process of demolding should be much easier, since our mold is already separated into different pieces. We can still use these strategies, but we'll most likely have an easier time doing so. Whether we've planned to or not, sometimes partially cutting our mold is the best option to remove our master without damaging things. This may have been part of the plan from the beginning, or it may be a last resort. Either way, it's important that we know how to properly cut our mold so that we set ourselves up to remove our master and still have a useful mold. Let's review why we may need to cut our mold and the process of doing so effectively. Cutting our silicone mold may be our best option when removing our master becomes too difficult. In these situations, a few small relief cuts may be a better alternative to a ripped or a damaged mold that won't work properly. We may also have planned to cut our mold from the beginning during our mold design phase. This is common to do when a master has some complexities, but not enough to warrant a two-part mold. Whenever we cut our mold, we need to be aware that doing so will introduce a seam line wherever we cut. A seam line is the location where two separate pieces of silicone meet and do not quite perfectly align, causing a slight visible line on our castings. This is a normal part of mold making and is something we take into account for any multi-part mold. Seam lines are easily cleaned up after casting if we use them appropriately. To ensure a limited and easily cleaned up seam line, we'll want to cut our mold two different ways. The first cut we'll want to do will be towards the outside of our mold. This cut will be jagged and uneven. Cutting a pattern like this will ensure our silicone mold aligns with itself and locks into place when we put it back together. If we only cut a straight line, it would be difficult to get our two halves properly aligned, leading to imperfect castings. After we've cut our jagged edge, we can move to where our silicone meets our master and cut a more straight line. Since our cut is straight here, the seam line we create will also be straight. Our final cuts will be slightly uneven ones that connect our jagged outside lines to our straight ones on the inside. Slightly uneven cuts in the middle will also help lock our mold together when we go to cast. Although it's easy and really tempting to keep cutting down our mold, we will want to stop periodically and see if the current depth of our cut is enough to actually free our master. We don't want to continue to cut unnecessarily. Doing so will only make aligning our mold more difficult and increase the amount of seam lines that we need to clean up on our castings. Sometimes our demolding process can feel extra difficult. A lot of stretching and pulling isn't quite releasing the master from the silicone or we just can't seem to get the bottom of the mold to release from the master. In these situations, 
we can use a few release helpers to help break the tension between our master and our mold as a last resort. Let's look at a few release helpers and see how they're used. Our first option for some extra help is actually compressed air. Carefully aiming a small amount of compressed air into our mold between the master and the silicone can force air into some hard to reach places, including the base of our master. It's not uncommon for this process to immediately dislodge our master, or even in some cases for it to pop out of our mold. Because of this, we'll want to be careful here and always wear the proper PPE. Always start with a little bit of air at a lower pressure in spurts before just opening things up. We may not need a lot of pressure to free our part. If we don't have access to compressed air, then we can use isopropyl alcohol instead. We can relieve the tension between our mold and the master by pouring a small amount of alcohol or just using a spray bottle instead. Then we can work our mold just like before to allow the alcohol to make its way down and around our master. Once it's found its way between our mold and the master, it'll be much easier to separate the two. If we don't have any isopropyl alcohol on hand or if we're not comfortable using it, we can use warm water in combination with dish soap instead following the exact same process. Regardless of the release helper we use, we'll want to make sure that we remove any excess that may be left over after removing our master. If you want to stay in the know, then sign up for our email, text, and follow us on social where you can see the latest and greatest projects, courses, and other beautiful things that people just like you are making every day. Thank you again for joining us on this course, and we'll see you in the next one.